This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I uh, really appreciate the, uh, the invitation uh, to be with you guys today and to talk about some of the work that we're doing around using digital health to strengthen the patient-provider bond. Now, I'm an adult gastroenterologist. Um, I see we have some gastroenterologists in the room. Uh, I'm going to be, my orientation is around adults because I'm an adult doctor, uh, but everything that I'll be talking about today can and is being used just as readily in the pediatric population. So as I go through some of these models, I like to think creatively about how we can use some of these techniques uh, with your patients and your populations and, and your patients' families in particular. So you're aware of this, that things are changing. Things are changing rapidly. This is something that we hear about, but we're now finally starting to see this tidal wave of change, not just uh, in how healthcare is financed and how healthcare is organized and how healthcare is delivered, uh, but even with the digital health explosion and the explosion in big data in particular, that's allowing us to transform how we deliver healthcare and to do it in, for the better. There's been a lot of discussion and debate about whether this idea of big data is really helpful or harmful, and there's examples in both directions. But what I'd like to talk about today are examples where we can use health analytics and we can use digital health technologies to improve the way we deliver care, putting more of a kind of positive spin on it. And as you hear this and as you go through it, uh, you'll think about some of the downsides of doing this sort of work, and I'll try to address that as well as we, as we go through. Now we think about the way that we deliver healthcare now, the way our system is set up to deliver healthcare, there are several limitations. There are sort of boxes that we work within. To begin with, the care that we deliver is generally designed for populations, not for individuals. Now what do I mean by that? Now we take care as clinicians in the trenches, we take care of one person at a time, one patient at a time the person in front of us, and their family. And that's our general orientation. Um, but we even think about the data that we use to, to, in, to make the clinical decisions. We use guidelines, for example, that are de developed for large groups of patients, not necessarily for the patient who's right in front of you. Even the randomized controlled trial data that we use, which is the highest level of evidence, is derived from hundreds or thousands of patients. It may or may not apply to the patient who's sitting in front of you. So we always struggle with this disconnect between the evidence that we have and the patient sitting right in front of us. We want to be specific and we want to be tailored and precise in how we deliver care. And we're already limited in many ways by the evidence that we have at our fingertips. Organizationally, some other issues is that we focus our care around the provider visit, historically. There's this moment in time when we come together in a room and we have an exchange of ideas and concepts and we lay hands on and we make decisions and then we leave and the patient leaves. And then that's it. But we know that 99% of patients' lives are spent outside of our view and they continue to have their illness and their pain and their cough and whatever it else is that they're experiencing and we generally have no connection whatsoever to what's happening for the most part except for informal systems like emails or phone calls. This leads to poorly timed and off-target interventions. It leads to reactive care where somebody's in the emergency department now and maybe could have been preempted if we had known about what was going on before that time. It's also profoundly unempowering to patients and their families to not have the care that they need at the time that they need it, the education information that they need when they need it. So this leads to uh, ina inadequate care in many cases. So the idea is that we want to move to the sort of future where we reverse all of that, where we're tailoring care to the individual, we're increasingly delivering care at home, even inpatient care at home. 
Patients who should be admitted to the hospital, now at Cedar sinai we're experimenting with healing at home, where the patient who needs to be in the hospital actually goes straight home with a nurse and with, uh, with provider visits and telehealth supporting that. And it's been incredibly successful so far. We should be more timely, specific, proactive, and empowering. So that's this sort of grand vision of what we're trying to achieve. And we're down here at the bottom, and we're trying to get up to the top. What I want to talk about today are some examples of how we can try to get there using these three different examples, three different platforms, digital health platforms. Social media, which may not seem like an obvious place to start, so I won't start there, but I'll get there. Patient provider portals, which includes mobile health applications and smartphone applications and wireless biosensors or wearable sensors, of which there's been a lot of discussion since Apple released its health kit recently. So I want to talk about these three. And uh, again, I'll be giving some examples from my own work, which is adult-oriented. But again, as you go through this, you can easily adapt it to, to your populations. So you know, we talk about healthcare delivery as if it's sort of this big organism. And we try to coordinate care. That's what the Affordable Care Act wants us to do, to coordinate care across an entire healthcare system. But in the trenches, it's a patient and a provider. And of course, these gender roles could just as easily be reversed. I want to make that important point. There's a patient and there's a provider. It's when we multiply this tens and hundreds and thousands of times that it becomes a healthcare delivery system. But in the end of the day, this is the unit of healthcare delivery that we're working with. So we have to deeply and fully understand this interaction. So what are the components of this interaction right now? Well, the first component is the doctor or the healthcare provider needs to assess the patient. And that includes a variety of things. What is the patient and the patient's family, what is their agenda? What would be a successful visit for them? How often do we ask that question? How often do we actually find out what would be successful today? So that when you leave this room, you are comfortable that we've achieved your goals and objectives. We obtain a comprehensive history, we, and then we under, try to understand, and this is hard to do, the emotional context within which the symptoms are occurring. What is the greater environment like? What is the social environment like? In the same time, we're trying to understand the patient's knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, and the family's knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs about the illness. We're trying to identify educational needs, all in this quick moment in time. And then we're conducting physical examinations, and we're going through all the logic that we've been trained to go through in our mind. And then we need to feed back information to the patient. We have to identify and communicate the information, the, the diagnosis, in a way that's clear and coherent to the patient and the family. To provide education and provide appropriate counseling. We need to order the right tests. We need to develop a targeted treatment plan. And then we need to document all of this in the much maligned electronic health record, which is generally designed to support the transactional needs of administrators and billers, not necessarily to support the human relationship between patients and their providers. And we have to do all of that in about 15 to 20 minutes, right? That's impossible to do. It can't be done. It can't be done once. It can't be done twice. It can't be done all day long, day in and day out, for months and for years and for an entire career. This is why there's a crisis in primary care right now in particular. Primary care doctors have just about had it with all the demands on their time and the requirements on their time to be, have to do all of this and then to get squeezed from both ends to maintain a high quality but also to increase RVUs and do all this. It's not possible. It's not acceptable. It's just not something that humans can do reliably over and over and over again. Now, we do the best that we can, but in order to do that, we have to sometimes take shortcuts. There's a lot of different shortcuts that we take. And you know, great clinicians can do that. They can look at somebody and use their gestalt and sort of you know, put, put patients into bins and make quick diagnoses that are accurate. But to require us to do that all day long for, forever is just not acceptable. We're going to make mistakes. So this is the unit of healthcare delivery, and it's being squeezed and stepped on. And that is bad news for all of us. So how can we improve that? That's part of what, uh, what I want to talk about today. So uh, normally, though, as I said, this is usually happening within the four walls of a clinic or a hospital or an office, but 99% of her life is spent outside of our view, and she's continuing to have symptoms. But in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases, she has a computer. This is sort of a bulky computer. She may have a smartphone or a tablet, and we certainly have computers. And we have patient provider portals now. You know, we have Epic and MyChart. And um, she can send stuff to us. 
Now, what is this? This is an example of a software system that we've developed and that we're using now in our clinic. And this is called MyGI Health. Um, and I want to show you this as an example of how we can try to squeeze some clinical functionality out of the electronic health record. So it isn't just a you know, repository for data about what we do to patients, but is an interactive tool for how we can collaborate with patients. And that's the idea behind patient provider portals. If they're developed correctly and used correctly, they can enhance value for us as doctors and as healthcare providers and for the patients and their families. So this is an example of a system where a patient will go online before they come to see us. They can do it on a tablet, they can do it on a smartphone, and they can do it on a computer. They can do it in the waiting room or they can do it in the comfort of their home when they have time and energy to sit down and answer questions. There's a little video about it online if you want to watch more. A friend of mine does trailers for Paramount Pictures and he put this great little video together for us. So this is an example and there's a whole bunch of questions. And it turns out there's hundreds and hundreds of questions. But patients are not required to answer hundreds of questions. The computer is sort of quote unquote smart and will weave the patient through the most important questions. It took four years of work in NIH research to get to this point where we're trying the best we can to almost simulate uh, an outstanding, in this case, gastrointestinal doctor, gastroenterologist. What would be the questions you know, that Dr. Vargas would ask or that maybe I would ask a patient? We've, we've actually c uh, programmed the computer to try to get pretty close to that. And it asks a whole bunch of questions. And if the patient has pain, it wants to know where the pain is. And if the pain is up here, it's going to ask more symptoms about dyspepsia, about acid reflux disease. And it's going to narrow down more and more depending upon uh, the specific um, symptoms. And then all of this can be uh, mailed to the doctor or the healthcare provider in advance. Now, in a surveillance system where we have something like a telemedicine center, we can receive this information in real time and evaluate it, even if the patient is not scheduled to come in for a visit. And then we can reach out to the patient in different ways, whether it's just a telephone call or an email, secure email, or through an e-portal communication. Or it may look like somebody really needs to come in because they're not doing well, and we call them in to, uh, to see us. I mean, the way we currently call people in to see us is this arbitrary, I'll see you in X weeks method. I'll see you in two months. What's going to be happening in two months? You, have, you know, who knows? Why two months? I'll see you in six weeks. Why six weeks? I mean, why do I say that? Uh, because I have not, I, I'm estimating the natural history of this disorder, and I have an estimate of sort of how the patient's doing, and there's some, te you know, some test cooking. Six weeks sounds good. I don't know. Maybe we need to see the patient two days or six months. We have no idea because it's just out to pasture. No idea what's happening as all these folks are walking around uh, with their illness experiences. So we can call them in when we need to. We then have a computer between us, and we can look at that computer and get output like this. Now, this is something called PROMISE scores. Um, some of you may have heard of the NIH PROMISE initiative, Patient Reported Outcome Measurement Information System, PROMISE. It's a 10-year NIH initiative to create a set of publicly available questionnaires that are computer-based, and there's a whole pediatric section of PROMISE as well. So if you're not familiar with PROMISE, you should check out the pediatric part, a lot of outstanding pediatricians working within the PROMISE consortium. These are scores that we developed for gastrointestinal symptoms. And just like when you get a hemoglobin, you know if it's high or low because there's a normal distribution around that hemoglobin. You know what normal hemoglobins look like, so then you can figure out if your patient's hemoglobin is in that range or out of that range. The same thing applies to symptoms, right? And we normally sort of say, how are you doing, or scale from 0 to 10, or something like that. This is like a hemoglobin, except for GI symptoms. So this is showing me how people compare on a percentile score to other people in the country who have the same symptoms. So in this case, this particular patient has a lot of constipation. And not just a lot, compared to other people who are constipated, is in almost a 95th percentile. So I know this is significant constipation this particular patient is experiencing. Patient does have heartburn, but actually is below the mean for people who have heartburn in the community. So maybe I don't need to focus on that immediately. So the computer does this kind of stuff. Uh, and if I want to learn more about the pain, I can look in and see more about the pain. This is a picture of the application that, that we're using. Um, and we're going to have a publicly facing version of it soon. And I want to show you this now, because as you read this, as I'm talking, you can kind of see that it's a history of presenting illness. 
and it's full of a lot of um, you know specific, very clinical language. And as you kind of kind of scan through it, you'll see that it's a, a history of a patient who has a constipation. And we know what the patient's goal for the visit is. That's this patient's objective. That would be a sign of success if we can achieve that. And it goes in all sorts of detail about Bristol type of stool. And this is like a perfect col uh, con constipation history. If one of my fellows wrote this, I'd give them a gold star for the day. Now, the thing about this particular history is it wasn't written by any human at all. The only person that was involved was the patient. So the patient was interviewed by the computer and the computer took that illness experience and converted it into doctor speak. And it's now available through the electronic health record. So a patient who's sitting in the waiting room, I have a full history on them already. Now obviously that's easier with people that can use computers and adults and I imagine for small kids, uh, uh, you know, uh, family members could help fill this out. We don't have this for kids, uh, but it works really well for adults. Now this isn't meant to replace a doctor, by no means. Computers are terrible at making diagnoses. There's been all sorts of interest in using artificial intelligence to make diagnoses, but we really need humans to make diagnoses in this day and age, despite all the IBM excitement around Watson. Watson is, I'm, I'm not yet at all convinced that Watson can make diagnoses the way humans can. And it's because we think differently from computers. We still think differently even from Watson. But computers can collect information. Or they, we know they're good at that and they can collect really good information on a patient and never miss anything. It's like Atul Gawan's checklist, if you're familiar with Atul Gawan's work and the checklist. This is basically a checklist. It's just a very complicated checklist. Now we did a study recently and we wanted to see how these histories compare to the physician obtained histories. So we did this study, a little bit sneaky, where we had 75 patients who are coming to GI clinics here at UCLA and across the street at the VA and uh, the patients all had a history obtained by their doctor, and it was written out and put into the chart. And it's right there. And we've got IRB approval, the whole thing. And then before the patient was, uh, after the patient had seen the doctor, they sat down with the computer and the computer took a history. So we had two histories side by side on the same patient. We then sent them out to blinded reviewers all across North America. And we asked them to just audit the quality of these histories. They had no idea that half of them are written by a computer. Just wanted to sort of say, hey, we're, we're auditing the quality of histories that we get in, in the clinic. Uh, and we had a very standardized checklist. There's some you know, validated instruments for this kind of thing. And we looked at, sort of in this case, man versus machine. And in this case, Aegis stands for Automated Evaluation of Gastrointestinal Symptoms. That's the name of the software. And when we looked at overall impression, the completeness of the history, how useful it was to somebody reading it, and how organized it was, the computer consistently outperformed the doctor. Now again, that doesn't mean we're replacing doctors. It also doesn't mean that the Aegis history was necessarily accurate. There's some debate about that. Some interesting discussions have emerged. But uh, for uh, somebody reading the chart, it was a lot clearer and easier to understand and more thorough. We then had a CMS biller, a compliance auditor, also look at these. And we'd asked this compliance auditor, said, what level of complexity could you bill at, bill at for this, for this uh, encounter, just looking at the HPI? And 100% of the computer um, generated HPIs could be billed at the highest level of complexity versus about, I think it was 75% of the um, physician HPIs. So there are some advantages to doing this. And if, what we're experiencing, and we're testing this now, we have a grant to do this, is it doesn't replace, replace me. It just helps me. I have the HPI already written. Now, I could throw it out if I don't like it. I can edit it, I can expand it, I can do whatever I want to it, but I find that I actually look the patient in the eye for most of the interview because I already have all this information. And now I can talk to the patient, I don't have to worry about documenting as much on the history because it's done a great job of collecting it. This is an example of how we're doing it at the VA. Um, for those of you that have ever been in the VA, probably not too many of you, um, there's a drop down menu here and uh, My GI Health is one of the options. And then when we open it up, there are some kind of control screens that we get. All right, so I've been going through this model uh, of, you know, patient can use a computer and send information to the healthcare provider. Uh, but what about in the room itself? What else is happening in the room? We talked about how um, the HPI itself can be generated, and that can help, we think, we're studying this, strengthen that communication. We're going to be measuring the strength of that communication. We're doing that now. But what else can we do with this? 
Well, there's more that the computer can do for us. So let me give you an example. Um, this is what we call an education prescription. Now, again, it's adult-oriented. But what has happened here is the computer has looked at the patient's history and looked at the patient's promise scores and has pulled up an education prescription for that patient. We've worked with the University of Michigan and have developed a, a library of assets, educational assets, that cover all of gastroenterology. And they're mapped to specific features in the patient's history. So if the patient has a lot of constipation, they're going to get an educational prescription around constipation. In some cases, they can have that before they even see the doctor. That's the way I like it. Some doctors don't want the patient to get the education before they're seen. And that's another option, just turn it off. But in the room, if I want to, I can show the patient their education right there. So for, these are some screenshots of videos that we can pull up on the screen. So patients with acid reflux disease, um, we have some videos about that. Patients with biliary disorders, videos will come up. This is a video that talks about the mind-gut axis, the brain-gut axis. So patients who have chronic abdominal pain, you know, uh, functional abdominal pain, um, irritable bowel syndrome, we have a video that talks all about that. Uh, you'll notice this is a female figure. That's because the videos are actually specific to the gender. So if it's a, if it's a woman, then a female comes up. If it's a man, a male comes up. This is a, uh, an example that isn't necessarily too suitable for this time of day. Uh, anybody know what, what we're looking at here? What are these things here? You guys are quiet. I know our gastroenterologists know this. Yeah, well, this is a bacteria sitting on a piece of stool floating in the lumen of the colon. That's what this is. So it's not obvious. that. So it's a very artistic, actually, in a way, almost a beautiful explanation of literally how you move bowels through your body. And it's like this inner space journey through the lumen. And it's, it's gripping. These guys did an unbelievable job. And this is not the kind of thing I can easily explain to a patient. But I, I've done this now. We've done this with over 200 patients. I'm amazed just to see the, how, how gripped patients are watching these videos. And they're done. They're like, oh my god. You know, that was never seen anything like that before. And it, usually in a positive way, by the way. It's not <laughs> always a horrible experience for them. And we have been trying to understand, you know, are we offending people? And we've tried to create videos that are, that are uh, not offensive. Um, some doctors or clinicians may not like the education prescription that the computer called up. So just like when you go to Amazon, you have a shopping cart, you can pick and choose what goes into that cart. Um, here you can pick and choose what educational materials you want in the cart and modify it and then send it off to the patient. There's a share button and off, off it goes. Then they can have it uh, in their smartphone or uh, wherever they want it. I'm going to skip this. Okay. So I'm going to move on to sort of another set of examples. I'm switching gears a little bit. I'm kind of uh, surveying a lot of different areas within the digital health space. And I'm um, showing you some pictures. These are pictures of uh, if you go to Google and type in abdominal pain, or you type in irritable bowel syndrome, which is an area that I'm particularly interested in, get images like this. And these are striking images. They're, they're really striking. And it's really hard to capture that illness experience when you get 15 or 20 minutes in a clinic room. Um, questionnaires like Promise and other quality of life measures can try to get closer to understanding this illness experience. Uh, but that's always within the context of a physician visit. So the fact is most of all of this is happening outside of the physician visit. And I've made that point a few times. Most of this is happening outside of the clinic. And this brings up this well-known concept uh, of the Hawthorne effect. I'm sure pro probably most of you are, have heard of this before. So why do I mention this? Well, the Hawthorne effect is this form of reactivity where, where people will change what they're doing just merely by the fact that they know that they're being watched or being studied. This usually comes up in the context of a research trial, uh, but it certainly happens in everyday practice. This is what white coat hypertension is like the classic example. When patients come to us and they know they have 15 minutes, or their families know they have 15 minutes, they're going to give us a story that they know that needs to penetrate through to us. Sometimes it's a strategic story, not in a nefarious way. It's just they need to, get, to you know, get through to us so that we can understand exactly what's been happening. And it's not always an exact representation in either direction of what's been happening outside for the last you know, days, weeks, or months. 
It's this very artificial compressed experience. And that's what we go by. That's how we make decisions every day. So is there a way that we can learn more about what's happening to people in a free range style, kind of outside in general? And I've given you one example with patient provider portals, mobile health applications. But this idea of passive monitoring, whether it's through that or through social media, which I'll explain in a second, is a really powerful one. It's powerful to be able to follow people passively. It's powerful because it overcomes the Hawthorne effect. Now this brings up a model that I want to tell you about now. It's a two by two table for outcome measurement. And as I think about outcomes research and I think about disease monitoring, this is the model that I've been thinking about. And so the idea is that there's two types of information that we can get from patients. There's subjective information, the sort we've been talking about, the abdominal pain, the nausea, the headache, whatever it is that patients are experiencing, uh, the loneliness, the, sa you know, the sadness, all of these uh, patient reported outcomes or PROs. There's objective information, right? There, obviously there's biomarkers, but there's also physiologic markers that we can monitor with wa wearable sensors. And then we can measure things actively and we can measure things passively. So up here is an example where we can use a survey or when we can measure patient reported outcomes or PROs actively. We can measure subjective information. We send out a questionnaire through a smartphone or a website. We ask patients to complete it. We get the information. But what about up here? Passively measuring subjective information. This is where social media gives us some really interesting insights and opportunities to learn about patients' lives outside of our eyes. And I'll give you some examples. Down here is where biosensors fit in, wearable sensors where we can do it actively, where patients have to like, push a button every time they're feeling something, or passively, where we're just, just by wearing the sensor, uh, you're, we're monitoring patients. So let's talk about social media for the next part, give you some examples of how social media is being used in clinical research and increasingly in clinical practice. And I, have, I actually do have a pediatric example here. So if you're interested in general in how social media is being used in healthcare, there's a, a very long um, kind of website that you're not going to be able to write down. But if you just Google Computer Services Corporation, there's a white paper that goes very nice. It's freely available that goes through lots of examples of how this is being used. And it's, it's really an interesting read. But in it, they, they have sort of a working definition of social media. So it's a process of people using online tools and platforms to share content and information through conversation and communication. That's a general working definition, in this case, of social media. So social media is everywhere. Um, I'll ask here for a second. Who here has a Twitter account? Raise your, raise your hand if you have a Twitter account. Uh, OK. Oh, you weren't, you weren't sure at first, then you decided that you did. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, I'm a little embarrassing. So that's kind of the point, is most of us don't. Um, that was more than the adult audience. That was amazing, because I think about 20 to 25% of you raised your hand. I recently uh, gave this lecture in front of 300 adult gastroenterologists. How many do you think raised their hand as they have a Twitter account? Any guesses out of 300? Three. Yeah, five. It wasn't zero. It was five. Five people. Now, there might have been more that were too embarrassed, or there's like some stigma um, to using Twitter. But there's a huge disconnect between our lives and sort of what, what, what we're doing and what our patients are doing. I think that I would imagine it's especially true for many of your patients, right, where social media defines who they are in many, many ways. So we do need to kind of meet folks uh, in the cyberspace a little bit and understand what's going on. I, I g was giving this lecture. I teach this in the School of Public Health. I actually give, um, I, I have a class on, on health analytics, and one of the lectures is on social media. And I, I did not have a Twitter account, any of this stuff. So I finally decided I just had to join, and I did recently. So now I'm on Twitter as well. And it's actually really, really fascinating uh, and extremely valuable professionally. I get immediate information on just the people that I want to follow. But that's more of a side discussion. So there's this whole you know, world out there. We know about this. So uh, before I get any farther, um, one question that comes up is, how can you use this for any kind of research purpose? Uh, is that ethical? Uh, the answer is it's ethical. Every time anybody like me signs on to Twitter, you know, there's that long thing that nobody reads, and there's the box that everybody clicks. And in it, it says, what you say, literally says, what you say on Twitter may be viewed all around the world instantly. It's for the whole world to see. Uh, there's no IRB involved. It, unless you're going to intervene and talk to people, then it becomes an IRB issue. 
Otherwise, it's a freely publicly available data repository that is unbelievably rich with information. So this is a picture of Europe. You can kind of see it, right? And um, the light's on it, but, but you can see that there's a lot of lights. And it looks like a satellite image of Europe at nighttime, right? But there's something weird about it, and it's that the different colors of the countries are different colors. You know, why should the lights of Portugal be different from the lights of Spain? And that's because those aren't lights at all. Every one of those little lights is actually somebody using Twitter in Europe. And they've just mapped it out on a map. And it's tremendous. I mean, unbelievable information. This is, we talk about epidemiologic research, ICD-9, ICD-10 codes, and doing all the secondary data analysis. That is, that is nothing compared to what's available here. We have millions of people talking about anything and everything in the world. And they're all over the place. And this is, uh, this is Europe. These are people that get on an airplane. And of course, they can't stop tweeting. They can't handle it. They can't stop, so they tweet. Then they get on the plane, and they're all anxious about not being able to tweet. And then they land, and then they tweet. And then this guy has just connected the dots with these wisps. And it's showing you how people are going, traveling all around the world tweeting at their destinations. This is a little bit bleached out on the screen. Um, but anybody know where, where we're looking at now? Yeah, this is LA. This is Los Angeles. And um, some interesting things about that. What's that? <laughs> right. So those are our students <laughs> surrounding us right now tweeting like mad, tweeting in class, tweeting outside of class. Look at that concentration of activity right here. Now, there's a lot of people out on the beach who should be sightseeing, and they're tweeting. There's people on the 405 freeway that are busy tweeting. There's people all over the place putting information out into the public. Um, so this is crazy. Well, actually, this is crazy. I meant to say this is just crazy, that, but this actually is truly crazy. So this is a, an example of the power of using this publicly available information. This is now a public health issue. This was just recently this year. Somebody standing on an overpass with a rifle, and he says, if I get, if I get 100 people to retweet this, I'm going to shoot the next MF that walks by. This is the happen here in Los Angeles. So somebody, a retweet is when you take the tweet and you send it out to other people. Somebody saw that and said, that's not right. Um, I'm going to call the police. And then the police got that, and they found who this account is registered to, and, went, and they found this guy, and they arrested him and took his rifle away. So this is an example where actually this is becoming a public health tool. It, you can use these databases to triangulate on threats rapidly. In my other life, I have an interest in threat detection. And I was involved um, in a shooting at the UPMC Medical Center two years ago. Thankfully, I wasn't uh, shot at. Uh, I won't go into that right now. You can look online and read about it. Um, I received a letter here at UCLA from a patient who talked about guns. And he was a patient at UPMC, and he was asking me for help. And I reached out, and um, nothing happened. And two weeks later, he walked in the medical center, opened fire, and five people were shot. Now, I've developed some ideas around that. I've written a little bit about it. And that point there is if, in that case, people had talked to one another, we could have easily found and triangulated on this guy long before anything had happened. And that's, that case has now been studied. And there's actually a documentary being made about it now. So that's a, a very much an aside, but the point here is we can use information that's latent and in the background, but if we have a way to connect it together, we can triangulate on threats, including health threats that patients are experiencing. So with that sort of uh, morbid aside, um, how is social media being used in healthcare? This is also laid out in that white paper that you can, you can pull up if you're interested. And I'm not going to read all of these right now. You can kind of just scan through them. Um, and I want to give you some examples of how affinity groups are being formed, how we can educate patients, how we can monitor patients, how we can use it even to find patients, get them interested in taking their anti-rejection meds after a transplant, like it's being done at the University of Iowa. There's examples out there that are really fascinating. Now, at Mayo Clinic, they realize that this is a powerful thing, and we need to understand it. We need to truly understand the power of using this as a monitoring tool 
um, and as an outcomes research tool, and as a digital health bridge to our patients. And they created the, um, the Center for the Study of, uh, I forget the exact name, it's uh, um, Healthcare and Social Media or something like that. And there's a book that they wrote. It's a thin monograph and it goes through exactly what Mayo Clinic is, how they're conceptualizing the use of social media in healthcare. This is um, one of the most famous examples now of how social media uh, can make a difference. This is called the SCAD ladies. I didn't, I didn't come up with that name. Um, but they called themselves the SCAD ladies. That's the sponta spontaneous coronary artery dissection, which is a very rare event. And in this case, what happened was a, a younger woman, uh, like a recent mom, I think she was in her late 20s, had severe crushing chest pain, walked into the emergency department, and they said, you know, you're a young woman, you're not having a heart attack. Uh, and she was discharged. And she went home and she came back and said, I'm, I'm still having severe chest pain. And eventually it was discovered that she was having an MI. Surprising she didn't get a troponin just by walking through the door. But she was diagnosed with the SCAD condition. And then she went online and she tried to find other people. And she ended up through various social media channels and e-forms finding a group, and all, almost all women, who had the exact same story. And they all realized, man, we're like this, the world's largest cohort of SCAD patients. And they marched themselves to the Mayo Clinic. And uh, this is also uh, incredibly ironic. The Mayo Clinic, what's ironic is the, first the name of the first author. Um, the Mayo Clinic wrote a paper about them. Sponta it's SCAD, a disease-specific social networking community-initiated study. So these patients came to them, and they're now the world's largest cohort of SCAD, and they've created this model where, where patients sort of self-assemble, they find each other, they, they come to a medical center where they're phenotyped correctly, and then uh, described, and now do kind of genotyping, do, doing prospective DNA studies, multi-center registries, and now we have the world's largest SCAD cohort through the Mayo Clinic, and they're being better understood uh, on all levels. It all started from truly a grassroots effort. You guys familiar with patients like me? No? That's interesting. Probably not as, as prevalent in the pediatric space. So this has become a really big resource for patients online. And uh, there's all sorts of information um, in patients like me about um, demographics, about what works and what doesn't, what medications are helping. And it's all, there's analytics around it. So everyone is just contributing their data to the patients like me, and you can go online and basically see a real-time large cohort observational trial of what's working and what isn't, uh, what, what patients are experiencing, what their symptoms are like. Uh, it's pretty slick. So, all right, that's all well and good, but can we use it in everyday clinical practice? So here's an example uh, in kids now at the UI Children's Hospital where they have the common problem of uh, adolescents who have had, in this case, a kidney transplant uh, sort of coming off of their anti-rejection meds. You know, vulnerable time, not exactly what kids want to do. You know this better than I do. And, but what a bad deal to stop, you know, to start rejecting after having been through this whole tumultuous experience of getting a transplant. So one of the docs there um, has, a, I think, a son who is really into social media and said, you know, what you need to do is you need to meet them on Facebook and tell them to take their meds through Facebook. And they created a system where, and, a, and it's tied into the electronic health record, where, and I'm not exactly sure technically how they've done this, but they're able to send through an, an application uh, programming interface, or API, a message from the EHR into their private Facebook account that says, you, you got to take your meds today. Did you take your meds today? You know, thumbs up. And they meet them right there on Facebook. And anecdotally, through sort of the media reports, although I've not seen a research study yet, they are improving the adherence with the anti-rejection medications and the kids that have been uh, put into this intervention. So this is a really interesting example. I'd love to see a randomized trial or some data, um, but maybe we don't need data. I mean, it, it seems like a great thing to do. We don't necessarily need an RCT for that. Here's the United States, and um, this is the United States now, looking at Twitter, uh, Twitter use. It's a little bleached out on the screen. Uh, but now what I want to show you is working with our computer scientist here, a guy named Corey Arnold here at UCLA, we're now throwing what's called an NLP, or natural language processing algorithm, across all of the tweets in the United States. And we're going to try to just find people who have Crohn's disease. And that's what we've done here, and it's also bleached out. But every one of these dots is someone who we think has Crohn's disease. 
And uh, that's based upon what they're talking about. And we go in and we have clinicians read the tweets to try to estimate, again, loosely, if they have Crohn's. I'll tell you, these people have Crohn's. And probably as better, or more accurate than an ICD-9 or ICD-10 code could tell you. Uh, and the algorithm is about 88% accurate in estimating from the physician as a gold standard. Um, and then here's Southern California. These are people walking around with Crohn's disease. So now we have this huge cohort, thousands of people with Crohn's disease, and we can listen into what they're talking about. We listen into how they're coping with their illness. This is using Atlas TI, which is a qualitative software analysis program, looking on all these different ways that people with Crohn's disease are coping. And uh, it's a little hard for you to read, but it doesn't really matter, but they're coping in all sorts of different ways. Or we're learning about what symptoms they're experiencing and in what, and in, in what um, kind of uh, groups of symptoms and do factor analysis to see if there are particular phenotypes that we can identify uh, using these kind of sort of um, uh, meta-analytic approaches. Here are basically the zeros and ones. These are the raw data of, of a research study. In this case, this is a study we're doing right now. We're looking at opioid-induced GI symptoms. And um, I imagine hopefully isn't as much of an issue for you guys, I don't know, but certainly um, a problem for us. And I mean, look, there's a r amazing stuff in here. Um, where is the one that I, oh yeah, dear morphine, thank you for taking away the pain, but you also took away my ability to walk without falling. Not cool, man, not cool. That's what that one says. So we have qualitative researchers that go through all these tweets and code them and put tags on them, and then we can kind of look at you know, larger scale analyses. Uh, in this case, uh, we're looking at Crohn's patients and have found that uh, we, can, we can cover the entire SF36 domains uh, very quickly just by looking at tweets. We're now creating uh, ways to try and use the information in Twitter uh, with a patient's uh, approval uh, and use it to automatically populate a graphical user interface. So as a clinician, I can see what major themes are occurring in a patient's lives and in what proportion. So it can supplement you know, the HPI that could be automatically obtained through a computer. This is an example of how this could be done on a worldwide level. This is a science article where they're looking at sentiment. This is called sentiment analysis, where you can estimate quality of life on a massive scale. We're not, we're not asking people to fill out little questionnaires. We're passively monitoring the world's Twitter population and looking hour by hour how, uh, how people feel. And these algorithms are pretty well worked out. And what's really interesting here is you can see there's a circadian rhythm uh, every day of the week, and no matter where you are in the world, uh, this time of day people tend to be awake, which is a good time to give a lecture. I often give this lecture after in the afternoon, and people are kind of like, you know, not so awake. And you can just see it here in the world's Twitter data. Really interesting, and you wonder, is there sort of a biological underpinning for this? It, it opens up all sorts of questions. For individual patients, we now are working on a way to, to monitor an individual's quality of life um, by doing sentiment analysis. They have to have a certain amount of activity in Twitter to be able to populate this. So we can try to estimate how, how, you know, how people are doing between visits. OK, my last topic is uh, move down to this part of the 2x2 two two table, the biosensor piece. Really kind of the, the most exciting for last, because you've heard a lot about biosensors, I'm sure. Or maybe you haven't, but uh, you'll hear more now. So um, where's your smartphone right now? Right? OK. Yeah, someone showed me. Does anybody not have a smartphone on their body right now? Oh, good. OK. I'm glad. <laughs> and very proud of it, which I think is fantastic. No hesitation. That's good. Yeah, I mean, uh, I. Yeah, I can't get too far from mine. So mine's, uh, I think, four feet away. So I'm not quite within three feet. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, just last night, I went out to, get, I, I, to pick up food. My wife sent me out to pick up dinner. And I'm driving. I'm like, oh, I forgot my phone. I mean, literally, I was like, what did I do? And I'm literally going down the street. And I come back. And I, I had this internal dialogue. I thought, how did I survive? How did I get before? How did I go get food before without a phone? <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But in the meantime, everybody has a phone on their body, and that is this tremendously powerful portal to the world, and it can be parlayed to perform physiologic measurements. And that's, of course, the whole wireless health movement, the whole wearable sensor movement, also called the quantified self movement. 
you may have heard this term, it's becoming a little increasingly well understood. The quantified self movement is this movement to incorporate you know, computing apps, wearable sensors, wireless communication to track inputs, health states, and mental and physical function. And these are examples of inputs and of states and of physical functions that we can now monitor in real time with wearable sensors. Anybody have one of these on, on your body right now? Anybody have a Fitbit? Not a wired group, huh? <laughs> not a wired group. Nobody here is wearing a Fitbit or an Up or a Shine or nothing. Not one person with a sensor on them. Amazing. That's the first time I've, uh, that's happened. Do you have, what do you have? What are you wearing? A pebble. Okay, that's, I'm going to give you credit for the pebble. <laughs> that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty hardcore. That's good. Okay, the pebble's, pebble's out there. I don't even have pebble on here yet. So here's the Fitbit, and here's the up, and this is the fuel band. And they recently let go a lot of people from Nike because this, this stuff is moving so quickly that people are kind of jumping on top of each other. You know, here's Serena Williams. She can't play, play a match without wearing her, her device. Here's the Shine. This is the latest one. It's called the Amigo. And the Amigo, I just got off the phone with the Amigo people. It's, it's this, um, it's got a triaxial accelerometer on it, and it can tell you, like, if you're brushing your teeth, if you're combing your hair, if you're, if you're weightlifting, if you're swimming, if you're doing breaststroke, or if you're doing a freestyle. Uh, it's waterproof. You know, it kind of, you know, it's like it's your therapist. It's the whole thing. It's everything in one. So that's coming out now. This is uh, me, um, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's not good, not good at all. So this is, this is me, this is my, these are my data, uh, this is, you know, in, in full transparency. Um, and this isn't good, and this is kind of what I do regularly, and it's not good. Uh, and I, I, I try to run, I run the LA Marathon every year, and I find that, you know, I can't, I can't continue to do that if this is how I'm going to live my life. I can't do it that way. So I get this feedback, and then the next day, I said, you know what? I'm going to, I got to fix that. And um, I was a champion that day. Um, I, I ran a little bit. You know, so the quantified self allows you to sort of see what you're doing and try to get feedback and improve. That's, that's the concept. Now, we're very fortunate here at UCLA. We have the Wireless Health Institute. Bill Kaiser is a world leader in wearable biosensors. And I've been very fortunate to work very closely with him for several years now. When the winner of the LA Marathon crossed the finish line, and I, and I was about you know, like two hours behind him, um, he was wearing the sensors, the UCLA sensors. And they were being beamed through a cloud uh, system, a uh, cloud network. And the folks on the newscast were actually monitoring with a dashboard five of the top runners. And around mile 13 or 14, they were able to predict who was going to win the race based upon the stride dynamics and the foot contact time and a variety of biometric features. Really interesting stuff. And now what they're working on is working with Map My Run to use this technology so that you can have like a, a world-class coach in your ear who says you're pronating too much, you're supinating, you've got to increase your step time, your foot contact time needs to increase, constantly telling you what to do until you have your perfect stride. And that's available now. And we're actually testing that in all, in all things in patients with rheumatoid arthritis to see if they can stay on their embryo. That's another discussion. Um, so this can be used to provide feedback for lots of reasons. Here he is. And I'm nowhere near him. So there are other targets that we can measure with wearable sensors, particularly psychometrics. We can estimate psychometrics with brain activity, sleep activity, pupil size, and so on. Autonomic function, sympathetic, parasympathetic. Sleep is really important. I think I said that. Here is a, a, a woman resting very comfortably with a band across her head. And um, it turns out, that, so this is a product called the Zio, and it was one of the first on the market. Um, and it, it provides really incredible detail around sleep architecture. What, how much REM sleep is, how much sleep is she getting? It's all right there. Now the interesting thing is this is no longer on the market because it's been usurped by better technologies and people didn't like having a band around their head. And the amazing thing is, this is how we normally do sleep studies, <laughs> right? And now this is unacceptable. <laughs> but this is still how we do sleep studies. I mean, look, this thing, I was looking at this last night. It says chest, like just so you know where to put it. <laughs> I mean, what, what kind of system is this? So it's like you have $5,000, and we're going to bill insurance, 
I know you can't sleep really well, but here's the deal. I need you to go into this thing that looks like a hotel room. We have a bunch of one-way mirrors. Don't worry about those and cameras on you. And we're going to wire you up. You just need to go to sleep. And then we're going to measure you all night. <laughs> what kind of a deal is that? So these folks um, actually tested to see whether the wireless sensor can correlate with total sleep time, or TST, compared to the full polysomnography. And you don't see our values like this like in nature. This is a perfect, perfect replacement for the $5,000 polysomnography. And you can do it day in and day out, not just a one-time $5,000 deal. You know, so we can do this for $100 now. This is the Q sensor. It was developed out of MIT. It's a way of measuring emotional stress, physical stress, um, and uh, cognitive stress. It's a galvanic skin resistance monitor. This is an old technology, but what's new about it is it's a wireless sensor. It goes around the wrist, and it provides real-time feedback about uh, stress. Here are uh, patients uh, riding a bike. There's through a few different patients. You can see second-to-second -second differences in their stress. Here's a cognitive stressor where they're doing serial sevens. And here's emotional stressors. It's five minutes of this uh, horrible zombie movie. I forget which zombie movie it was. Uh, my good friend Max Brooks uh, wrote World War Z. I, I grew up with him, but it wasn't his movie. So I, 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 was, I was asking about that. But in any event, we've got this person who's really freaking out. And then we've got this person who's sort of like psychopathic, who has no emotional response at all to this. <laughs> so you can see there's biologic variation of the same exact situation. This is a woman who's got, you know, I, I guess she's comfortable walking around the streets of New York with this thing around her head. And what it is is an EEG, but it's amazing. What it does is it reads her mind, sort of, and it shows her mindset on a screen. It's a metaphorical narrative. So as she's relaxing and comfortable, there's a bucolic scene on the, on the iPad. And the clouds sort of part, and it's sunny, and there's birds, and there's flowers. But as intrusive thoughts start to come in, and she starts to get a little bit anxious, and maybe starts getting some abdominal pain, or whatever, the lightning kind of, the clouds come in, lightning strikes, it looks dark, and she, she can literally see what's happening in her brain. Imagine how powerful that could be if we could figure out how to use these kinds of technologies for our own patients. This is the happy fork. For our obese patients, the, one of the strongest predictors of obesity is the speed at which patient, people eat. That's probably some of you are nodding, you know that. This thing will vibrate in your hand if you start to eat too fast. It'll literally tell you that you're eating too fast, you need to slow down, and give you reports. Now, there's obviously some limitations to this. It looks to me like a, like a baby spoon or something, and it's not, you know, you carry it around in your pocket. I'm not sure how that works, but it's a way to train our patients to eat slower. This is the Proteus device. I'll be done in a sec. Um, and it, what it allows you to do is to track whether people are taking their medicines. And there's a tiny like, grain of sand that is connected to the pill. And when, when the patient swallows it, uh, it will track that they've swallowed it through a wireless sensor on that grain of sand that's connected to, um, a, to, a, a, to a sensor. What's amazing about it is it has no batteries or anything. It's activated by gastric acid. And that activates the, ba the battery cell. And this is um, now where we're getting, we're getting to the point of having flexible, uh, reshapable electronics so that you can put sensors just as a patch. So we'll be moving away from Migos and Pebbles. You can just have this thing stuck on your skin. It could be disposable. Uh, these disposable devices are now being used to deliver medications um, in patients who have seizures. And they, and they can pick up that they're seizing and deliver a small dose of, of anti-seizure medications. And this has been studied recently in a, in a Nature paper. More of the same. In our asthmatic patients, we can put this um, propeller device, it's called, which is FDA approved, on the MDI. And it will tell us and the patient when they're using it, but also explain where they are. What are the particulate matters? What's the pollen count? Where in the city are they at the time that they're having their asthma attacks? Just think about all the information we can gather about the attacks themselves and to give behavioral feedback about where it's happening, why it's happening, what the, po what the particulates are so that they can pre prepare and predict. And this has now been shown in randomized trials to improve outcomes in asthma. The last thing I want to end with um, is an example of a sensor that, that we've developed here at UCLA. And this is stethoscope. It was invented in 1816 uh, by a guy named Rene Lenec. And we can now miniaturize these things. And we can put them on an abdomen. And a computer can analyze the sounds for us. So that in addition to the patient reported outcomes, 
we can have real-time information on what's happening in her belly and the size of her belly and the tension of her wall and then overlay symptoms. So we have patient-reported outcomes, PRO, and patient-reported informatics, PRI. And in this case, we have created this thing called Abstats. It's a disposable tegadermatiered biosensor. It sticks on the abdominal wall and it's about $10 to manufacture. It's got a miniature microphone in it and it sits there and it listens on the abdominal wall. We're using it in post-op patients right now, but it can be used for a lot of purposes, certainly in pediatrics too. And a computer analyzes the sound. This is a migrating myoelectric complex or stomach growl. This is the acoustic appearance of an MMC. And this is our first actual inpatient post-operative tracing. This is not an EEG. This is an acoustic sensor that's measuring activity in the belly. And uh, what we found is that we're now using it as a feeding stoplight. We're doing it here at Ronald Reagan. We're now starting it at Cedars, and we're doing it at the VA with our surgeons, where the surgeons post-op will get either a green light, which means the patient should advance their diet right away, or a yellow, di yellow uh, light, which means you can begin a liquid diet, or a red light, which means don't feed this patient or they're going to throw up. And right now we ask, you know, are, have, you pa have you passed gas? And we listen with a stethoscope for 12 seconds. That's sort of medieval stuff. That's not, that's not very advanced. So we just published this paper last week, and uh, we were able to show that this green, yellow, and red light concept actually makes sense, that the sensor can detect among these three different groups. This is showing you intestinal rate per second. Um, and I'll skip that. Here's the paper. Uh, we, I just want to show you, we were in the Daily Bruin this week, which is very exciting. There's Professor Kaiser, and there's me, and we're holding our sensors. So that's our, that's our big moment in the sun. And I'm done with this, so I'll end with this. If you're interested in more about this topic, this is a book by Eric Topol. It's called The Creative Destruction of Medicine. And it's, uh, it's a very good review of how digital health, how the digital revolution is creating better health care. I recommend you take a look at that. Here's some folks in our group who have done a lot of the work uh, that I've been showing you today. And there's more that aren't pictured there. And this is an overview of everybody that's been involved. And with that, I will stop and thank you for your attention.